In today's episode, Aiko and Wasun Energy join us to explain ABC and HJT. Will one dominate or is the future big enough for both? Let's welcome our handsome guests today. Hi, Thomas and Christian. Oh, hi, Shemaine. Uh, thanks very much for having us. Um, it's wonderful to be able to talk about which amazing technology is the best uh, out of two great choices. Uh, so my name uh, is Thomas. I'm the uh, country director for ICO in Australia. Uh, I'm a PV engineer, so my training is in making solar panels. And uh, I'm also an electrician, so uh, I'm here to represent the interests of the back contact crowd. Hi, it's my man. Hi, Thomas, everybody. My name is Christian Gomez. I've been working for solar for 20 years now, most of it for Hetero Junction. We have a long history, and I'm very happy to represent Huasan as the largest manufacturer. Not to fight about technologies, but really to explain more about what makes each one of back contact and head special. So to begin, we want to hear some key insights about the technologies that you both are representing. The idea is that what you have with a solar cell uh, around the cell is called passivation, and you can do that with different ways. And heterogeneous uses amorphous and microcrystalline silicon, and that has shown to be the best passivation for the solar cell since over 25 years. Why we think it is the best choice is a combination of topics. Let's say the most important one is that the performance per kilowatt peak of heterogeneous is the highest of all available technologies. This is based on three things. The bifaciality of the cell is the highest, the temperature coefficient of the cell is the lowest and the low light performance of the module is the best as well. Yeah, so back contact technology uh, has always been excited e e even since the 70s when it was sort of first conceived at, at Purdue and uh, later refined by the likes of SunPower. Um, it's always held that attraction that getting rid of the metal on the front side lets more light in. We're making some great strides in back contact on the bifacial area. We think it's really appealing from an availability of materials perspective and for integration with perhaps tandems. And I think the HJT uh, will also fe feed into that in terms of our knowledge going forward for, for tandem type products. Uh, so it's all very exciting, but um, back contact we think uh, uh, has the, the wood on the other technologies in the market from the point of view of that front side efficiency. We've heard the claims. Now let's talk about manufacturing and scalability. Thank you, Chamin. My first question to you, Thomas. Are ABC panels truly scalable or do they shine in boutique rooftop installs? Well, I think in the past people thought that it wasn't scalable because it was developed in some markets that don't have uh, China's expertise in mass man manufacturing. Um, so what's changed is that we've got the biggest cell exporter, the solar cell exporter, ICO, and the biggest solar cell manufacturer, that's Longi, uh, putting all their resources into back contact uh, manufacturing. What they bring to the table is the ability to manufacture at scale. One of the key facilities for back contact, it's in uh, Zhuhai in China. That's basically in the Bay Area of China, which is the manufacturing heart from a robotic standpoint. And even if you want to look at uh, storage like BYD and those sort of people are down in that delta. Because of that expertise and that 20 years of making solar cells in those areas, uh, we were able to do that mass manufacturing in a way that maybe we couldn't do 10 years ago. Now moving on to you, Christian. So-called ease of manufacturing still hasn't made HJT cheap. If ABC is expensive, HJT is still pricey. What's your take on that? With the current cost structures, heterogeneous is cheaper to produce than back contact cells. So right now we are a bit more expensive than bifacial topcon and a bit uh, cheaper to produce than back contact cell based on topcon, which is the state of the art. The point here is manufacturing is easy, but the machines are extensive, mostly due to things like the vacuum level that they have to achieve. The key advantage of a simple manufacturing is not just the cost, is the fact that with only four steps, the quality during manufacturing of the cell is very easy to control because you can do it after each one of the steps in manufacturing, and that's uh, guaranteeing a better output in quality. Thomas, do ABC panels deliver enough real-world gains to justify the premium price per watt? Yeah, they 100% they do. So we're already seeing the LCOE is competitive with uh, the Topcon uh, bifacial and Topcon monofacial products. And so it, it's in general, it'll require less area of, of uh, site if you're doing the ground mount projects uh, it will re require less railing and that's going to bring savings with it that more than outweigh possible premiums on the on the panel costs in terms of whether it's worth it it's, it's already at that point it's not really a craft industry let's say um, it's certainly got uh, as much scale just in the back contact architecture as maybe the, the whole industry had uh, going back uh, a decade or so so uh, out of control in the way that there might have been in, in history if looks doesn't matter is ABC's premium anything more than a style tax 
I think the aesthetics is a bonus. So the, the story of that contact is all about efficiency. Efficiency is relevant for everyone. It plays out in terms of the surface area of the project or the time to execute the project. It also plays out in terms of what's possible for a solar cell to generate. I, I think that uh, if we want to talk about aesthetics, there's a concept called glint. Um, so not only do the panels look better when you hold them in your hand in the showroom, but if I was to look across a solar farm, uh, let's say in New Zealand or a beautiful German countryside, you do see uh, glare, which happens with all surfaces. But what you see with, let's say, metal contacts like the silver on a Topcon panel, you see that glint from the metal underneath that glass. We can take that away and we can bring some uh, amenity to the community there and make solar more acceptable. With silver, both costly and scarce, is AGD truly sustainable or just expensive? So, uh, Heather Ancient uses actually a state of the art of 2025, the same or less silver than top comb by Fashion, and less silver than um, traditional back contact cell if it's not using copper plating. Um, we have prepared the transition to copper plating to completely uh, remove uh, from the metallization the silver, and that uh, can be done. Uh, it is just a matter of cost, and I think that it will happen in case we really pass as a total industry the terawatt of yearly production, because then is when the silver cost becomes probably too high. When shifting from silver to copper, do you foresee any performance uh, or efficiency drawbacks, or is it actually an improvement? That's a very good question. In heterogeneity, we are lucky because uh, we can implement copper plating easily in terms not just of process, but most importantly about reliability. When you implement copper on the surface of a solar cell made of silicon, you always have the danger of the copper going into the PN junction and breaking the cell, causing damage. In heterogeneity, we have a layer at the top, which is called TCO, transparent conductive oxide, that protects the actual silicon from the cell. So it is much easier to implement copper plating in terms of reliability for heterogeneity than any other cell technology based on silicon. Scale, check. Cost, check. On this round for durability and environmental stress. Thomas, ABC modules look great from the front. But when sunlight hits the rear, do they underperform compared to my facial panels? Yeah, try and back. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. There's, there is a bit of a myth uh, which flows from the early back contact panels that weren't bifacial that you, you can't do bifaciality uh, with this product. So the first thing I wanted to say out of the gate is we can do bifaciality uh, with back contact. Uh, we uh, have now got panels in the field um, that have that 80% bifaciality, uh, which uh, if we go back two or three years, I think the maximum was about 65. So we've had a big leap uh, in terms of the bifacial characteristic of these panels. Um, the other thing is to say, when we look at the bifaciality of a panel, you have to understand that overall the panel has higher output. So we're talking about a bifaciality of a much higher front side energy. Um, so if, if we consider that fact, uh, we're certainly competitive. Additionally, what we actually think is that we're gonna see a trend away from centralized uh, plants uh, around the world. Christian, lower temperature processing has raised uh, red flags about long-term addition. What concrete steps have been taken to prevent these modules from delaminating in the field? The actual curing of the modules happens in a very similar way in all modules. The processes that are high temperature or low temperature are related to the impurity uh, diffusion on the wafer. And in terms of heterogeneity, we need to keep all processes below about 250 degrees because if we surpass that, uh, we would damage the structure of the cell. However, there is a part of that uh, that is true, and it is that the surface of the cell uh, needs to be glued perfectly into the lamination, and results for heterogeneity show that we need to take care of that well. And in the past, uh, the use of flux for the soldering, low temperature soldering, if the quantities of flux were not well regulated, there was a delamination caused by this excess flux, uh, flux on the surface. This was a problem, I remember, back then in 2005, 2006, in some panels. I think after 2009, I have seen zero cases of that. If a cracked cell starts causing losses, can ABC technology prevent silent power drain? Or is that the trade-off for a flawless exterior? In terms of the manufacturing process and how EL testing works, essentially we're injecting a, uh, a current into the module. We're taking an image of that. You can see uh, the illuminated regions uh, as you would with any other panel. I've been to the factory probably uh, more times than, than most humans. Uh, and uh, when we go through that process, um, you, you see that they are withdrawing panels from the line where that is detected. So I, I don't think there's any challenge there. It speaks out in the results. The output power is great. 
the EL images are amazing. Uh, in that case, I think we've, we've ticked the box in terms of making sure that we get a good output for the system. If we drill back into why do we care about micro cracks, it's for their potential to reduce the output of the module. And we're not seeing those reductions. In fact, we're seeing amazing results under stress testing for the output power post stress. You are piling on layers like it's a cake. How confident are you that these delicate amorphous layers won't crumble under UV or PID stress over time? Regarding specifically UV irradiance, we have a two-way approach. The first one is that um, heterangion has a natural annealing effect, which means that it recovers the degradation from UV when the module is at a high temperature, like 50 or 60 degrees. And the second is that in every module that we sell, we put in the encapsulant uh, light conversion film and UV blocking films, so that every UV uh, light, all the UV light that arrives to the module, gets either transformed into visible light or blocked uh, completely from the module. PID is the interesting part because due to the surface uh, of heterangion, the cell surface chemistry, we don't have the classic PID effects. So that was something that uh, never happened. Uh, that's pretty good. Actually, the key point about PB plant owners and roof owners is that when they choose heterovention, they choose the platform that has been showing for so many years actual results of uh, very low degradation on the field. And that is quite a remarkable situation. Let's take a little step further. When it comes to future readiness and recyclability, which one is truly built to last? All right, Chamba, the floor is yours. Thomas, removing front bush burst give ABC panel a clearer look and a slight efficiency boost. Does this really add value for end users? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that uh, are maybe missed uh, from doing this uh, move to the backside. So first of all, it makes management of voltage and current much easier. So we can actually make some of the disassembly and recycling a little bit easier. So our vision with the copper based product is actually that it will be significantly easier to recycle when compared to uh, panels that are made of an amalgam of many different materials. But we think that uh, going uh, so far as to bring the contacts onto the rear of the panel, it does open you up to uh, not only that navigator, but also that shade optimization. So if we look at some of those self bar bypass functions that you do see in the ICO back contact, um, it lets us to handle, for example, soiled sites uh, or sites where there wasn't trees and shading before you installed the panels, but later the trees grew up, later the TV area was erected or something like that. And that will have the effect of increasing the longevity of projects. Uh, so we think that's a great contribution to make in terms of thinking of sustainability. Has any utility scale or residential litter shown a real energy gain from no front bush birth? Uh, yes, I mean, there's uh, sites around the world. We've got site, uh, test sites uh, here in Australia. We've got test sites uh, in Italy, in Spain, and in China um, showing those gains. The back contact shade optimization responds really well to patchy or partial shading. If you have big blocky shading that shades, let's say, a third of the cell, a third of the panel, uh, you don't see that benefit. The benefit is pronounced where a diode would have engaged, but we avoid engaging that diode. Now moving on to you, Christian. How much does bifacial gain really add for rooftop systems with low albedo? Is it worth the investment? It is difficult to say generally. Um, we have uh, rooftop systems and typically they perform about 1% or 2% better in terms of energy compared to non-bifacial systems made with the same panels if they were not bifacial. So there's always an edge in terms of performance that you get when you use the bifaciality. However, on rooftops or on flat roofs, uh, those situations are not the most, um, let's say, the best application of bifaciality, even for back contact cell. You will see that the power beams for bifacial back contact cell are maybe about 10 watt lower than the power beams of non-bifacial back contact cell. This is just a situation that is uh, due to the technology. Should HJT stop chasing bifacials for rooftops and cut costs using monofacial designs since the gains are minimal? Uh, again, it's very difficult to say because if we look at uh, flat rooftops, then we see that we are already going into a different module design. Uh, we are working with some partners uh, like Over Easy, and they are doing vertical thin modules for flat rooftops where bifaciality is very, very important. If we're talking about residential rooftops, our aim is to go in about two years to tandem with perovskite in which the efficiency goes so much higher that is very clearly the point for, uh, let's say, tilted rooftops, where bifaciality is, again, only maybe 1% more yield. And in case head of sky, because of whatever reason, doesn't work out very well, um, heterangion can do back contact cell as well, with a higher efficiency than back contact cell topcon, which is the current technology. 
HDD is already hitting almost 40% in tandem labs. Can ABC genuinely compete with the next generation integration? Or is it confined to pushing single junction limits? We are talking about uh, lab uh, stuff rather than practical products. Um, uh, we do sense that there'll be some convergence between the HJT concept and, and back contact uh, going forward. Um, let's say the Provs guide doesn't achieve the stability that um, everyone hopes for. Um, we do see that as one of the pathways. The efficiencies we are seeing uh, at the moment are in that sort of 30% um, category. Um, and uh, based on our research trajectory, we, we think that there will be a pathway to get to around 40% uh, in a tandem architecture, but we're still some ways away from doing that. Um, there's a couple of uh, hold hold ups on that. One is the uh, mechanisation of this manufacturing is actually is more difficult. The other thing is the availability of, of materials. So we're talking before about going to TCO that um, doesn't have uh, indium inside. Um, that will be another factor in terms of which way we go because some of these rare earth materials that we're considering for these future um, uh, processes, uh, there are competing demands for these materials from other industries. So that will guide where we're headed. But in terms of a 30% because if we look at a fridge that lasts for 10 years, we look at cars, people buy new cars, hold them five years, pass them another generation, 15 years they're gone. Um, solar panels uh, are expected to have a lifetime at least 15 years, but ideally out to 25, 30, 40 years. Um, so that um, puts a strong impetus on the need for stability and we just don't see any great signals right now that in the next two years we're going to have that stability. So we think probably uh, back contact, refining that, maybe in the HDT area uh, is where the, where the industry will be headed uh, in the near term. Christian, with silver, indium and uh, dual glass, how ready is recycling to handle HDT's material at scale? Um, recycling is uh, quite an easy topic for heterojunction. I was in the working groups and we uh, found out how to do from a technical and logistic point of view all of the steps to recover the materials. And actually heterojunction was an easier thing to do compared to most of the other technologies. What portion of silver and indium can actually be recovered from an HGT module using current recycling methods? So from the metallization point of view, you recover almost everything. Um, because you do some thermal um, activities to separate the metal from the non-metal. And it is basically, in terms of recycling, um, you go remove the frame, if you have a frame, then uh, you separate the laminate, you get the metal out, and what you are left with is uh, glass and some kind of plastic that you can burn and take away. Even in our current production, we use, I think, about 30% recycled uh, silicon already. Mm, that is really something that has been solved, um, and I see no problem with the status quo, because the only thing you need to do is, at a logistical level, make sure that you actually get the panels into a recycling center. That, that is the actual challenge. Get the owners to get the panels, send them to a recycling center where this is being done and not just thrown somewhere where they will not be worked on. I believe that wraps up all my questions. A very nice discussion we just had today. Thanks everyone and back to you, Charmin. Before we wrap up, any final notes for um, all back contact technology and heterojunction technology from both of you guys? Yeah, well, thank you very much to uh, to Christian, yourself, Charmaine, and of course, uh, Tramback. I'd just love to share uh, what an exciting time to be alive where you've got um, uh, these great technologies going head to head. And, and from our side, we, we're so excited to be bringing real world efficiency to the market. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I think in 2025, there are no bad cell and module technologies on the market. So it is not a competition in terms of uh, one good, one bad. It's just finding out more details to know what is more convenient for each application. That's a wrap on today's debate. ABC or HJD, which one really wins your confidence? Tell us in the comments below. And subscribe to catch the next showdown right here on ENF Trade TV.